英語聞き流しリスニング、英語テキストと MP3 ダウンロード、その他の物語はホームページからお聞きいただけます。88thpp.com 88thpp.com Chapter 29 Which treats of the droll device and method adopted to extricate our love-stricken knight from the severe penance he had imposed upon himself? Such, sirs, is the true story of my sad adventures, judge for yourselves now whether the sighs and lamentations you heard, and the tears that flowed from my eyes, had not sufficient cause even if I had indulged in them more freely, and if you consider the nature of my misfortune you will see the consolation is idle, as there is no possible remedy for it. All I ask of you is, what you may easily and reasonably do, to show me where I may pass my life unharassed by the fear and dread of discovery by those who are in search of me. For though the great love my parents bear me makes me feel sure of being kindly received by them, so great is my feeling of shame at the mere thought that I cannot present myself before them as they expect, that I had rather banish myself from their sight for ever than look them in the face with the reflection that they beheld mine stripped of that purity they had a right to expect in me. With these words she became silent, and the color that overspread her face showed plainly the pain and shame she was suffering at heart. In theirs the listeners felt as much pity as wonder at her misfortunes, but as the curate was just about to offer her some consolation and advice Cardinio forestalled him, saying, So then, Signora, you are the fair Dorothea, the only daughter of the rich Clenardo? Dorothea was astonished at hearing her father's name, and at the miserable appearance of him who mentioned it, for it has been already said how wretchedly clad Cardenio was, so she said to him. And who may you be, brother, who seem to know my father's name so well? For so far, if I remember rightly, I have not mentioned it in the whole story of my misfortunes. I am that unhappy being, Signora, replied Cardenio, whom, as you have said, Lucinda declared to be her husband. I am the unfortunate Cardenio, whom the wrongdoing of him who has brought you to your present condition has reduced to the state you see me in, bare, ragged, bereft of all human comfort, and what is worse, of reason, for I only possess it when heaven is pleased for some short space to restore it to me. I, Dorothea, am he who witnessed the wrong done by Don Fernando, and waited to hear the yes uttered by which Lucinda owned herself his betrothed. I am he who had not courage enough to see how her fainting fit ended, or what came of the paper that was found in her bosom, because my heart had not the fortitude to endure so many strokes of ill fortune at once, and so losing patience I quitted the house, and leaving a letter with my host, which I entreated him to place in Lucinda's hands, I betook myself to these solitudes, resolved to end here the life I hated as if it were my mortal enemy. But fate would not rid me of it, contending itself with robbing me of my reason, perhaps to preserve me for the good fortune I have had in meeting you. For if that which you have just told us be true, as I believe it to be, it may be that heaven has yet in store for both of us a happier termination to our misfortunes than we look for, because seeing that Lucinda cannot marry Don Fernando, being mine, as she has herself so openly declared, and that Don Fernando cannot marry her as he is yours, we may reasonably hope that heaven will restore to us what is ours, as it is still in existence and not yet alienated or destroyed. And as we have this consolation springing from no very visionary hope or wild fancy, I entreat you, Senora, to form new resolutions in your better mind, as I mean to do in mine, preparing yourself to look forward to happier fortunes, for I swear to you by the faith of a gentleman and a Christian not to desert you until I see you in possession of Don Fernando, and if I cannot by words induce him to recognize his obligation to you, in that case to avail myself of the right which my rank as a gentleman gives me, and with just cause challenge him on account of the injury he has done you, not regarding my own wrongs, which I shall leave to heaven to avenge, while I on earth devote myself to yours. Cardenio's words completed the astonishment of Dorothea, and not knowing how to return thanks for such an offer, she attempted to kiss his feet, but Cardenio would not permit it, and the licentiate replied for both, commended the sound reasoning of Cardenio, and lastly, begged, advised, and urged them to come with him to his village, where they might furnish themselves with what they needed, and take measures to discover Don Fernando, or restore Dorothea to her parents, or do what seemed to them most advisable. Cardenio and Dorothea thanked him, and accepted the kind offer he made them, and the barber who had been listening to all attentively and in silence, on his part some kindly words also, and with no less good will than the curate offered his services in any way that might be of use to them. He also explained to them in a few words the object that had brought them there, and the strange nature of Don Quixote's madness, and how they were waiting for his squire, who had gone in search of him. Like the recollection of a dream, the quarrel he had had with Don Quixote came back to Cardenio's memory, and he described it to the others, but he was unable to say what the dispute was about. At this moment they heard a shout, and recognized it as coming from Sancho Panza, 
who, not finding them where he had left them, was calling aloud to them. They went to meet him, and in answer to their inquiries about Don Quixote, he told them how he had found him stripped to his shirt, lank, yellow, half dead with hunger, and sighing for his lady Dulcinea, and although he had told him that she commanded him to quit that place and come to El Toboso, where she was expecting him, he had answered that he was determined not to appear in the presence of her beauty until he had done deeds to make him worthy of her favour, and if this went on, Sancho said, he ran the risk of not becoming an emperor as in duty bound, or even an archbishop, which was the least he could be, for which reason they ought to consider what was to be done to get him away from there. The licentiate in reply told him not to be uneasy, for they would fetch him away in spite of himself. He then told Cardenio and Dorothea what they had proposed to do to cure Don Quixote, or at any rate take him home, upon which Dorothea said that she could play the distressed damsel better than the barber, especially as she had there the dress in which to do it to the life, and that they might trust to her acting the part in every particular requisite for carrying out their scheme, for she had read a great many books of chivalry, and knew exactly the style in which afflicted damsels begged boons of knights errant. In that case, said the curate, there is nothing more required than to set about it at once, for beyond a doubt fortune is declaring itself in our favour, since it has so unexpectedly begun to open a door for your relief, and smooth the way for us to our object. Dorothea then took out of her pillowcase a complete petticoat of some rich stuff, and a green mantle of some other fine material, and a necklace and other ornaments out of a little box, and with these in an instant she so arrayed herself that she looked like a great and rich lady. All this, and more, she said, she had taken from home in case of need, but that until then she had had no occasion to make use of it. They were all highly delighted with her grace, air, and beauty, and declared Don Fernando to be a man of very little taste when he rejected such charms. But the one who admired her most was Sancho Panza, for it seemed to him, what indeed was true, that in all the days of his life he had never seen such a lovely creature, and he asked the curate with great eagerness who this beautiful lady was, and what she wanted in these out-of-the-way quarters. This fair lady, brother Sancho, replied the curate, is no less a personage than the heiress in the direct male line of the great kingdom of my Comicon, who has come in in search of your master to beg a boon of him, which is that he redress a wrong or injury that a wicked giant has done her, and from the fame as a good knight which your master has acquired far and wide, this princess has come from Guinea to seek him. A lucky seeking and a lucky finding, said Sancho Panza at this, especially if my master has the good fortune to redress that injury, and right that wrong, and kill that son of a bitch of a giant your worship speaks of, as kill him he will if he meets him, unless, indeed, he happens to be a phantom, for my master has no power at all against phantoms. But one thing among others I would beg of you, Señor Licentiate, which is, that, to prevent my master taking a fancy to be an archbishop, for that is what I'm afraid of, your worship would recommend him to marry this princess at once, for in this way he will be disabled from taking archbishop's orders, and will easily come into his empire, and I to the end of my desires, I have been thinking over the matter carefully, and by what I can make out I find it will not do for me that my master should become an archbishop, because I am no good for the church, as I am married, and for me now, having as I have a wife and children, to set about obtaining dispensations to enable me to hold a place of profit under the church, would be endless work, so that, Señor, it all turns on my master marrying this lady at once, for as yet I do not know her grace, and so I cannot call her by her name. She is called the Princess Mycomicona, said the curate, for as her kingdom is Mycomicone, it is clear that must be her name. There's no doubt of that, replied Sancho, for I have known many to take their name and title from the place where they were born and call themselves Pedro of Alcala, one of Ubeda, and Diego of Valladolid, and it may be that over there in Guinea queens have the same way of taking the names of their kingdoms. So it may, said the curate, and as for your master's marrying, I will do all in my power towards it, with which Sancho was as much pleased as the curate was amazed at his simplicity and at seeing what a hold the absurdities of his master had taken of his fancy, for he had evidently persuaded himself that he was going to be an emperor. By this time Dorothea had seated herself upon the curate's mule, and the barber had fitted the oxtail beard to his face, and they now told Sancho to conduct them to where Don Quixote was, warning him not to say that he knew either the licentiate or the barber, as his master's becoming an emperor entirely depended on his not recognizing them. Neither the curate nor Cardenio, however, thought fit to go with them, Cardenio lest he should remind Don Quixote of the quarrel he had with him, and the curate as there was no necessity for his presence just yet, so they allowed the others to go on before them while they themselves followed slowly on foot. The curate did not forget to instruct Dorothea how to act, but she said they might make their minds easy, as everything would be done exactly as the books of chivalry required and described. They had gone about three quarters of a league when they discovered Don Quixote in a wilderness of rocks, by this time clothed, but without his armour, 
and as soon as Dorothea saw him and was told by Sancho that that was Don Quixote, she whipped her palfrey, the well-bearded barber following her, and on coming up to him her squire sprang from his mule and came forward to receive her in his arms, and she dismounting with great ease of manner advanced to kneel before the feet of Don Quixote, and though he strove to raise her up, she without rising addressed him in this fashion. From this spot I will not rise, valiant and doughty knight, until your goodness and courtesy grant me a boon, which will redound to the honour and renown of your person and render a service to the most disconsolate and afflicted damsel the sun has seen, and if the might of your strong arm corresponds to the repute of your immortal fame, you are bound to aid the helpless being who, led by the savour of your renowned name, hath come from far distant lands to seek your aid in her misfortunes. I will not answer a word, beauteous lady, replied Don Quixote, nor will I listen to anything further concerning you, until you rise from the earth. I will not rise, senor, answered the afflicted damsel, unless of your courtesy the boon I ask is first granted me. I grant and accord it, said Don Quixote, provided without detriment or prejudice to my king, my country, or her who holds the key of my heart and freedom, it may be complied with. It will not be to the detriment or prejudice of any of them, my worthy lord, said the afflicted damsel, and here Sancho Panza drew close to his master's ear and said to him very softly, Your worship may very safely grant the boon she asks, it's nothing at all, only to kill a big giant, and she who asks it is the exalted princess my Comicona, queen of the great kingdom of my Comicona of Ethiopia. Let her be who she may, replied Don Quixote, I will do what is my bounden duty, and what my conscience bids me, in conformity with what I have professed, and turning to the damsel he said, Let your great beauty rise, for I grant the boon which you would ask of me. Then what I ask, said the damsel, is that your magnanimous person accompany me at once whither I will conduct you, and that you promise not to engage in any other adventure or quest until you have avenged me of a traitor who against all human and divine law, has usurped my kingdom. I repeat that I grant it, replied Don Quixote, and so, lady, you may from this day forth lay aside the melancholy that distresses you, and let your failing hopes gather new life and strength, for with the help of God and of my arm you will soon see yourself restored to your kingdom and seated upon the throne of your ancient and mighty realm, notwithstanding in despite of the felons who would gainsay it, and now hands to the work, for in delay there is apt to be danger. The distressed damsel strove with much pertinacity to kiss his hands, but Don Quixote, who was in all things a polished and courteous knight, would by no means allow it, but made her rise and embraced her with great courtesy and politeness, and ordered Sancho to look to Rocinante's girths, and to arm him without a moment's delay. Sancho took down the armour, which was hung up on a tree like a trophy, and having seen to the girths armed his master in a trice, who as soon as he found himself in his armour exclaimed, Let us be gone in the name of God to bring aid to this great lady. The barber was all this time on his knees at great pains to hide his laughter and not let his beard fall, for had it fallen maybe their fine scheme would have come to nothing, but now seeing the boon granted, and the promptitude with which Don Quixote prepared to set out in compliance with it, he rose and took his lady's hand, and between them they placed her upon the mule. Don Quixote then mounted Rocinante, and the barber settled himself on his beast, Sancho being left to go on foot, which made him feel anew the loss of his dapple, finding the one of him now. But he bore all with cheerfulness, being persuaded that his master had now fairly started and was just on the point of becoming an emperor, for he felt no doubt at all that he would marry this princess, and be king of my Comicon at least. The only thing that troubled him was the reflection that this kingdom was in the land of the blacks, and that the people they would give him for vassals would be all black, but for this he soon found a remedy in his fancy, and said he to himself, what is it to me if my vassals are blacks? What more have I to do than make a cargo of them and carry them to Spain, where I can sell them and get ready money for them, and with it buy some title or some office in which to live at ease all the days of my life? Not unless you go to sleep and haven't the wit or skill to turn things to account and sell three, six, or ten thousand vassals while you would be talking about it. By God I will stir them up, big and little, or as best I can, and let them be ever so black I'll turn them into white or yellow. Come, come, what a fool I am! And so he jogged on, so occupied with his thoughts and easy in his mind that he forgot all about the hardship of travelling on foot. Cardenio and the curate were watching all this from among some bushes, not knowing how to join company with the others, but the curate, who was very fertile in devices, soon hit upon a way of effecting their purpose, and with a pair of scissors he had in a case he quickly cut off Cardenio's beard, and putting on him a grey jerkin of his own he gave him a black cloak, leaving himself in his breeches and doublet, while Cardenio's appearance was so different from what it had been that he would not have known himself had he seen himself in a mirror. Having effected this, although the others had gone on ahead while they were disguising themselves, they easily came out on the high road before them, for the brambles and awkward places they encountered did not allow those on horseback to go as fast as those on foot. 
they then posted themselves on the level ground at the outlet of the Sierra, and as soon as Don Quixote and his companions emerged from it the curate began to examine him very deliberately, as though he were striving to recognize him, and after having stared at him for some time he hastened towards him with open arms exclaiming, A happy meeting with the mirror of chivalry, my worthy compatriot Don Quixote of La Mancha, the flower and cream of high breeding, the protection and relief of the distressed, the quintessence of knights errant. And so saying he clasped in his arms the knee of Don Quixote's left leg. He, astonished at the stranger's words and behavior, looked at him attentively, and at length recognized him, very much surprised to see him there, and made great efforts to dismount. This, however, the curate would not allow, on which Don Quixote said, Permit me, Señor Licentiate, for it is not fitting that I should be on horseback and so reverend a person as your worship on foot. On no account will I allow it, said the curate, your mightiness must remain on horseback, for it is on horseback you achieve the greatest deeds and adventures that have been beheld in our age, as for me, an unworthy priest, it will serve me well enough to mount on the haunches of one of the mules of these gentlefolk who accompany your worship, if they have no objection, and I will fancy I am mounted on the steed Pegasus, or on the zebra or charger that bore the famous moor, Muserac, who to this day lies enchanted in the great hill of Zulema, a little distance from the great Complutum. Nor even that will I consent to, Señor Licentiate, answered Don Quixote, and I know it will be the good pleasure of my lady the princess, out of love for me, to order her squire to give up the saddle of his mule to your worship, and he can sit behind if the beast will bear it. It will, I am sure, said the princess, and I am sure, too, that I need not order my squire, for he is too courteous and considerate to allow a churchman to go on foot when he might be mounted. That he is, said the barber, and at once alighting, he offered his saddle to the curate, who accepted it without much entreaty, but unfortunately as the barber was mounting behind, the mule, being as it happened a hired one, which is the same thing as saying ill condition, lifted its hind hoofs and let fly a couple of kicks in the air, which would have made Master Nicholas wish his expedition in quest of Don Quixote at the devil had they caught him on the breast or head. As it was, they so took him by surprise that he came to the ground, giving so little heed to his beard that it fell off, and all he could do when he found himself without it was to cover his face hastily with both his hands and moan that his teeth were knocked out. Don Quixote when he saw all that bundle of beard detached, without jaws or blood, from the face of the fallen squire, exclaimed, By the living God, but this is a great miracle. It has knocked off and plucked away the beard from his face as if it had been shaved off designedly. The curate, seeing the danger of discovery that threatened his scheme, at once pounced upon the beard and hastened with it to where Master Nicholas lay, still uttering moans, and drawing his head to his breast had it on in an instant, muttering over him some words which he said were a certain special charm for sticking on beards, as they would see, and as soon as he had it fixed he left him, and the squire appeared well bearded and whole as before, whereat Don Quixote was beyond measure astonished, and begged the curate to teach him that charm when he had an opportunity, as he was persuaded its virtue must extend beyond the sticking on of beards, for it was clear that where the beard had been stripped off the flesh must have remained torn and lacerated, and when it could heal all that it must be good for more than beards. And so it is, said the curate, and he promised to teach it to him on the first opportunity. They then agreed that for the present the curate should mount, and that the three should ride by turns until they reached the inn, which might be about six leagues from where they were. Three then being mounted, that is to say, Don Quixote, the princess, and the curate, and three on foot, Cardenio, the barber, and Sancho Panza, Don Quixote said to the damsel. Let your highness, lady, lead on whithersoever is most pleasing to you, but before she could answer the licentiate said. Towards what kingdom would your ladyship direct our course? Is it perchance towards that of my comicon? It must be, or else I know little about kingdoms. She, being ready on all points, understood that she was to answer yes, so she said yes, senor, my way lies towards that kingdom. In that case, said the curate, we must pass right through my village, and there your worship will take the road to Cartagena, where you will be able to embark, fortune favouring, and if the wind be fair and the sea smooth and tranquil, in somewhat less than nine years you may come in sight of the great Lake Miona, I mean Miotides, which is little more than a hundred days' journey this side of your highness's kingdom. Your worship is mistaken, senor, said she, for it is not two years since I set out from it, and though I never had good weather, nevertheless I am here to behold what I so long for, and that is my lord Don Quixote of La Mancha, whose fame came to my ears as soon as I set foot in Spain and impelled me to go in search of him, to commend myself to his courtesy, and entrust the justice of my cause to the might of his invincible arm. Enough, no more praise, said Don Quixote at this, for I hate all flattery, and though this may not be so, still language of the kind is offensive to my chaste ears. I will only say, senora, that whether it has might or not, 
that which it may or may not have shall be devoted to your service even to death, and now, leaving this to its proper season, I would ask the Señor Licentiate to tell me what it is that has brought him into these parts, alone, unattended, and so lightly clad that I am filled with amazement. I will answer that briefly, replied the curate, you must know then, Señor Don Quixote, that Master Nicholas, our friend and barber, and I were going to Seville to receive some money that a relative of mine who went to the Indies many years ago had sent me, and not such a small sum but that it was over sixty thousand pieces of eight, full weight, which is something, and passing by this place yesterday we were attacked by four footpads, who stripped us even to our beards, and then they stripped off so that the barber found it necessary to put on a false one, and even this young man here pointing to Cardenio, they completely transformed. But the best of it is, the story goes in the neighborhood that those who attacked us belonged to a number of galley slaves who, they say, were set free almost on the very same spot by a man of such valor that, in spite of the commissary and of the guards, he released the whole of them, and beyond all doubt he must have been out of his senses, or he must be as great a scoundrel as they, or some man without heart or conscience to let the wolf loose among the sheep, the fox among the hens, the fly among the honey. He has defrauded justice, and opposed his king and lawful master, for he opposed his just commands, he has, I say, robbed the galleys of their feet, stirred up the holy brotherhood which for many years past has been quiet, and, lastly, has done a deed by which his soul may be lost without any gain to his body. Sancho had told the curate and the barber of the adventure of the galley slaves, which, so much to his glory, his master had achieved, and hence the curate in alluding to it made the most of it to see what would be said or done by Don Quixote, who changed color at every word, not daring to say that it was he who had been the liberator of those worthy people. These, then, said the curate, were they who robbed us, and God in his mercy pardon him who would not let them go to the punishment they deserved. Chapter 30. Which treats of address displayed by the fair Dorothea, with other matters pleasant and amusing. The curate had hardly ceased speaking, when Sancho said, In faith, then, Señor Licentiate, he who did that deed was my master, and it was not for one of my telling him beforehand and warning him to mind what he was about and that it was a sin to set them at liberty, as they were all on the march there because they were special scoundrels. Blockhead, said Don Quixote at this, it is no business or concern of knights errant to inquire whether any persons in affliction, in chains, or oppressed that they may meet on the high roads go that way and suffer as they do because of their faults or because of their misfortunes. It only concerns them to aid them as persons in need of help, having regard to their sufferings and not to their rascalities. I encountered a chaplet or string of miserable and unfortunate people, and did for them what my sense of duty demands of me, and as for the rest be that as it may, and whoever takes objection to it, saving the sacred dignity of the Señor Licentiate and his honoured person, I say he knows little about chivalry and lies like a horse and villain, and this I will give him to know to the fullest extent with my sword, and so saying he settled himself in his stirrups and pressed down his morion, for the barber's basin, which according to him was Mombrino's helmet, he carried hanging at the saddle bow until he could repair the damage done to it by the galley slaves. Dorothea, who was shrewd and sprightly, and by this time thoroughly understood Don Quixote's crazy turn, and that all except Sancho Panza were making game of him and not to be behind the rest said to him, on observing his irritation, Sir Knight, remember the boon you have promised me, and that in accordance with it you must not engage in any other adventure, be it ever so pressing, come yourself, for if the licentiate had known that the galley slaves had been set free by the unconquered arm he would have stopped his mouth thrice over, or even bitten his tongue three times before he would have said a word that tended towards disrespect of your worship. That I swear heartily, said the curate, and I would have even plucked off a moustache. I will hold my peace, senora, said Don Quixote, and I will curb the natural anger that had arisen in my breast, and will proceed in peace and quietness until I have fulfilled my promise, but in return for this consideration I entreat you to tell me, if you have no objection to do so, what is the nature of your trouble, and how many, who, and what are the persons of whom I am to require due satisfaction, and on whom I am to take vengeance on your behalf? That I will do with all my heart, replied Dorothea, if it will not be wearisome to you to hear of miseries and misfortunes. It will not be wearisome, senora, said Don Quixote, to which Dorothea replied, well, if that be so, give me your attention. As soon as she said this, Cardenio and the barber drew close to her side, eager to hear what sort of story the quick-witted Dorothea would invent for herself, and Sancho did the same, for he was as much taken in by her as his master, and she having settled herself comfortably in the saddle, and with the help of coughing and other preliminaries taken time to think, began with great sprightliness of manner in this fashion. First of all, I would have you know, sirs, that my name is and here she stopped for a moment, for she forgot the name the curate had given her, but he came to her relief, seeing what her difficulty was, and said, It is no wonder, senora, 
that your highness should be confused and embarrassed in telling the tale of your misfortunes, for such afflictions often have the effect of depriving the sufferers of memory, so that they do not even remember their own names, as is the case now with your ladyship, who has forgotten that she is called the Princess Mycomicona, lawful heiress of the great kingdom of Mycomicon, and with this cue your highness may now recall to your sorrowful recollection all you may wish to tell us. That is the truth, said the damsel, but I think from this on I shall have no need of any prompting, and I shall bring my true story safe into port, and here it is. The king my father, who was called Tinocrio the Sapien, was very learned in what they call magic arts, and became aware by his craft that my mother, who was called Queen Jaramilla, was to die before he did, and that soon after he too was to depart this life, and I was to be left an orphan without father or mother. But all this, he declared, did not so much grieve or distress him as his certain knowledge that a prodigious giant, the lord of a great island close to our kingdom, Panifilando of the Scal by name, for it is averred that, though his eyes are properly placed and straight, he always looks askew as if he squinted, and this he does out of malignity, to strike fear and terror into those he looks at, that he knew, I say, that this giant on becoming aware of my orphan condition would overrun my kingdom with a mighty force and strip me of all, not leaving me even a small village to shelter me, but that I could avoid all this ruin and misfortune if I were willing to marry him. However, as far as he could see, he never expected that I would consent to a marriage so unequal, and he said no more than the truth in this, for it has never entered my mind to marry that giant, or any other, let him be ever so great or enormous. My father said, too, that when he was dead, and I saw Pantophilando about to invade my kingdom, I was not to wait and attempt to defend myself, for that would be destructive to me, but that I should leave the kingdom entirely open to him if I wished to avoid the death and total destruction of my good and loyal vassals, for there would be no possibility of defending myself against the giant's devilish power, and that I should at once with some of my followers set out for Spain, where I should obtain relief in my distress on finding a certain knight errant whose fame by that time would extend over the whole kingdom, and who would be called, if I remember rightly, Don Azote or Don Jigot. Don Quixote, he must have said, Senora, observed Sancho at this, otherwise called the Knight of the Rueful Countenance. That is it, said Dorothea, he said, moreover, that he would be tall of stature and lank-featured, and that on his right side under the left shoulder, or thereabouts, he would have a grey mole with hairs like bristles. On hearing this, Don Quixote said to his squire, Here, Sancho my son, bear a hand and help me to strip, for I want to see if I am the knight that sage king foretold. What does your worship want to strip for? said Dorothea. To see if I have that mole your father spoke of, answered Don Quixote. There is no occasion to strip, said Sancho, for I know your worship has just such a mole on the middle of your backbone, which is the mark of a strong man. That is enough, said Dorothea, for with friends we must not look too closely into trifles, and whether it be on the shoulder or on the backbone matters little, it is enough if there is a mole, be it where it may, for it is all the same flesh, no doubt my good father hit the truth in every particular, and I have made a lucky hit in commending myself to Don Quixote, for he is the one my father spoke of, as the features of his countenance correspond with those assigned to this knight by that wide fame he has acquired not only in Spain but in all La Mancha for I had scarcely landed at Osuna when I heard such accounts of his achievements, that at once my heart told me he was the very one I had come in search of. But how did you land at Osuna, senora? asked Don Quixote, when it is not a seaport? But before Dorothea could reply the curate anticipated her, saying, the princess meant to say that after she had landed at Malaga the first place where she heard of your worship was Osuna. That is what I meant to say, said Dorothea. And that would be only natural, said the curate. Will your majesty please proceed? There is no more to add, said Dorothea, save that in finding Don Quixote I have had such good fortune, that I already reckon and regard myself queen and mistress of my entire dominions, since of his courtesy and magnanimity he has granted me the boon of accompanying me whithersoever I may conduct him, which will be only to bring him face to face with Pantophilando of the Scowl, that he may slay him and restore to me what has been unjustly usurped by him, for all this must come to pass satisfactorily since my good father Tinocrio the Sapient foretold it, who likewise left it declared in writing in Chaldi or Greek characters, for I cannot read them, that if this predicted knight, after having cut the giant's throat, should be disposed to marry me I was to offer myself at once without demur as his lawful wife, and yield him possession of my kingdom together with my person. What thinkest thou now, friend Sancho? said Don Quixote at this. Hearest thou that? Did I not tell thee so? See how we have already got a kingdom to govern and a queen to marry. On my oath it is so, said Sancho, and foul fortune to him who won't marry after slitting Senor Pandahilado's windpipe. And then, how ill-favoured the queen is. I wish the fleas in my bed were that sort. 
and so saying he cut a couple of capers in the air with every sign of extreme satisfaction, and then ran to seize the bridle of Dorothea's mule, and checking it fell on his knees before her, begging her to give him her hand to kiss in token of his acknowledgement of her as his queen and mistress. Which of the bystanders could have helped laughing to see the madness of the master and the simplicity of the servant? Dorothea therefore gave her hand, and promised to make him a great lord in her kingdom, when heaven should be so good as to permit her to recover and enjoy it, for which Sancho returned thanks in words that set them all laughing again. This, sirs, continued Dorothea, is my story, it only remains to tell you that of all the attendants I took with me from my kingdom I have none left except this well-bearded squire, for all were drowned in a great tempest we encountered when in sight of port, and he and I came to land on a couple of planks as if by a miracle, and indeed the whole course of my life is a miracle and a mystery as you may have observed, and if I have been over minute in any respect or not as precise as I ought, let it be accounted for by what the licentiate said at the beginning of my tale, that constant and excessive troubles deprive the sufferers of their memory. They shall not deprive me of mine, exalted and worthy princess, said Don Quixote, however great and unexampled those which I shall endure in your service may be, and here I confirm anew the boon I have promised you, and I swear to go with you to the end of the world until I find myself in the presence of your fierce enemy, whose haughty head I trust by the aid of my arm to cut off with the edge of this, I will not say good sword, thanks to Hanes de Passamonte who carried away mine dash this he said between his teeth, and then continued, and when it has been cut off, and you have been put in peaceful possession of your realm it shall be left to your own decision to dispose of your person as may be most pleasing to you, for so long as my memory is occupied, my will enslaved, and my understanding enthralled by her, I say no more, it is impossible for me for a moment to contemplate marriage, even with a phoenix. The last words of his master about not wanting to marry were so disagreeable to Sancho that raising his voice he exclaimed with great irritation. By my oath, Señor Don Quixote, you are not in your right senses, for how can your worship possibly object to marrying such an exalted princess as this? Do you think fortune will offer you behind every stone such a piece of luck as is offered you now? Is my lady Dulcinea fairer, perchance? Not she, nor half as fair, and I will even go so far as to say she does not come up to the shoe of this one here. A poor chance I have of getting that county I am waiting for if your worship goes looking for dainties in the bottom of the sea. In the devil's name, marry, marry, and take this kingdom that comes to hand without any trouble, and when you are king make me a marquis or governor of a province, and for the rest let the devil take it all. Don Quixote, when he heard such blasphemies uttered against his lady Dulcinea, could not endure it, and lifting his pike, without saying anything to Sancho or uttering a word, he gave him two such thwacks that he brought him to the ground, and had it not been that Dorothea cried out to him to spare him he would have no doubt taken his life on the spot. Do you think, he said to him after a pause, you scurvy clown, that you are to be always interfering with me, and that you are to be always offending and I always pardoning? Don't fancy it, impious scoundrel, for that beyond a doubt thou art, since thou hast set thy tongue going against the peerless Dulcinea. Know you not, lout, vagabond, beggar, that were it not for the might that she infuses into my arm I should not have strength enough to kill a flea. Say, scoffer with a viper's tongue, what think you has won this kingdom and cut off this giant's head and made you a marquis, for all this I count as already accomplished and decided but the might of Dulcinea, employing my arm as the instrument of her achievements? She fights in me and conquers in me, and I live and breathe in her, and owe my life and being to her. O oh, horse and scoundrel, how ungrateful you are, you see yourself raised from the dust of the earth to be a titled lord, and the return you make for so great a benefit is to speak evil of her who has conferred it upon you. Sancho was not so stunned but that he heard all his master said, and rising with some degree of nimbleness he ran to place himself behind Dorothea's palfrey and from that position he said to his master. Tell me, senor, if your worship is resolved not to marry this great princess, it is plain the kingdom will not be yours, and not being so, how can you bestow favours upon me? That is what I complain of. Let your worship at any rate marry this queen, now that we have got her here as if showered down from heaven, and afterwards you may go back to my lady Dulcinea, for there must have been kings in the world who kept mistresses. As to beauty, I have nothing to do with it, and if the truth is to be told, I like them both, though I have never seen the Lady Dulcinea. How? Never seen her, blasphemous traitor, exclaimed Don Quixote, hast thou not just now brought me a message from her? I mean, said Sancho, that I did not see her so much at my leisure that I could take particular notice of her beauty, or of her charms piecemeal, but taken in the lump I like her. Now I forgive thee, said Don Quixote, and do thou forgive me the injury I have done thee, for our first impulses are not in our control. That I see, replied Sancho and with me the wish to speak is always the first impulse, 
and I cannot help saying, once at any rate, what I have on the tip of my tongue. For all that, Sancho, said Don Quixote, take heed of what thou sayest, for the pitcher goes so often to the well, I need say no more to thee. Well, well, said Sancho, God is in heaven, and sees all tricks, and will judge who does most harm, I am not speaking right, or your worship in not doing it. That is enough, said Dorothea, run, Sancho, and kiss your lord's hand and beg his pardon, and henceforward be more circumspect with your praise and abuse, and say nothing in disparagement of that lady Toboso, of whom I know nothing save that I am her servant, and put your trust in God, for you will not fail to obtain some dignity so as to live like a prince. Sancho advanced hanging his head and begged his master's hand, which Don Quixote with dignity presented to him, giving him his blessing as soon as he had kissed it, he then bade him go on ahead a little, as he had questions to ask him and matters of great importance to discuss with him. Sancho obeyed, and when the two had gone some distance in advance Don Quixote said to him, Since thy return I have had no opportunity or time to ask thee many particulars touching thy mission and the answer thou hast brought back, and now that chance has granted us the time and opportunity, deny me not the happiness thou canst give me by such good news. Let your worship ask what you will, answered Sancho, for I shall find a way out of all as I found a way in, but I implore you, senor, not to be so revengeful in future. Why dost thou say that, Sancho? said Don Quixote. I say it, he returned, because those blows just now were more because of the quarrel the devil stirred up between us both the other night, than for what I said against my lady Dulcinea, whom I love and reverence as I would a relic, though there is nothing of that about her, merely as something belonging to your worship. Say no more on that subject for thy life, Sancho, said Don Quixote, for it is displeasing to me, I have already pardoned thee for that, and thou knowest the common saying, for a fresh sin a fresh penance. While this was going on they saw coming along the road they were following a man mounted on an ass, who when he came close seemed to be a gypsy, but Sancho Panza, whose eyes and heart were there wherever he saw asses, no sooner beheld the man than he knew him to be Hanesta Pasamonte, and by the threat of the gypsy he got at the ball, his ass, for it was, in fact, Dapple that carried Pasamonte, who to escape recognition and to sell the ass had disguised himself as a gypsy, being able to speak the gypsy language, and many more, as well as if they were his own. Sancho saw him and recognized him, and the instant he did so he shouted to him, Ginesillo, you thief, give up my treasure, release my life, embarrass thyself not with my repose, quit my ass, leave my delight, be off, rip, get thee gone, thief, and give up what is not thine. There was no necessity for so many words or objurgations, for at the first one Hines jumped down, and at a like racing speed made off and got clear of them all. Sancho hastened to his dapple, and embracing him he said, How hast thou fared? my blessing, dapple of my eyes, my comrade? All the while kissing him and caressing him as if he were a human being. The ass held his peace, and let himself be kissed and caressed by Sancho without answering a single word. They all came up and congratulated him on having found dapple, Don Quixote especially, who told him that notwithstanding this he would not cancel the order for the three ass colts, for which Sancho thanked him. While the two had been going along conversing in this fashion, the curate observed to Dorothea that she had shown great cleverness, as well in the story itself as in its conciseness, and the resemblance it bore to those of the books of chivalry. She said that she had many times amused herself reading them, but that she did not know the situation of the provinces or seaports, and so she had said at haphazard that she had landed at Osuna. So I saw, said the curate, and for that reason I made haste to say what I did, by which it was all set right. But is it not a strange thing to see how readily this unhappy gentleman believes all these figments and lies, simply because they are in the style and manner of the absurdities of his books? So it is, said Cardenio, and so uncommon and unexampled, that were one to attempt to invent and concoct it in fiction, I doubt if there be any wit keen enough to imagine it. But another strange thing about it, said the curate, is that, apart from the silly things which this worthy gentleman says in connection with his craze, when other subjects are dealt with, he can discuss them in a perfectly rational manner, showing that his mind is quite clear and composed so that, provided his chivalry is not touched upon, no one would take him to be anything but a man of thoroughly sound understanding. While they were holding this conversation Don Quixote continued his with Sancho, saying, Friend Ponza, let us forgive and forget as to our quarrels, and tell me now, dismissing anger and irritation, where, how, and when didst thou find Dulcinea? What was she doing? What didst thou say to her? What did she answer? How did she look when she was reading my letter? Who copied it out for thee? and everything in the matter that seems to thee worth knowing, asking, and learning, neither adding nor falsifying to give me pleasure, nor yet curtailing lest you should deprive me of it. Senor, replied Sancho, 
if the truth is to be told, nobody copied out the letter for me, for I carried no letter at all. It is as thou sayest, said Don Quixote, for the notebook in which I wrote it I found in my own possession two days after thy departure, which gave me very great vexation, as I knew not what thou wouldst do on finding thyself without any letter, and I made sure thou wouldst return from the place where thou didst first miss it. So I should have done, said Sancho, if I had not got it by heart when your worship read it to me, so that I repeated it to a sacristan, who copied it out for me from hearing it, so exactly that he said in all the days of his life, though he had read many a letter of excommunication, he had never seen or read so pretty a letter as that. And hast thou got it still in thy memory, Sancho? said Don Quixote. No, senor, replied Sancho, for as soon as I had repeated it, seeing there was no further use for it, I set about forgetting it, and if I recollect any of it, it is that about scrubbing, I mean to say sovereign lady, and the end yours till death, the knight of the rueful countenance, and between these two I put into it more than three hundred my souls and my life's in my eyes. Chapter 31 Of the delectable discussion between Don Quixote and Sancho Panza, his squire, together with other incidents. All that is not unsatisfactory to me, said Don Quixote. Go on, thou didst reach her, and what was that queen of beauty doing? Surely thou didst find her stringing pearls, or embroidering some device in gold thread for this her enslaved knight. I did not, said Sancho, but I found her winnowing two bushels of wheat in the yard of her house. Then depend upon it, said Don Quixote, the grains of that wheat were pearls when touched by her hands, and didst thou look, friend? Was it white wheat or brown? It was neither, but red, said Sancho. Then I promise thee, said Don Quixote, that, winnowed by her hands, beyond a doubt the bread it made was of the whitest, but go on, when thou gavest her my letter, did she kiss it? Did she place it on her head? Did she perform any ceremony befitting it, or what did she do? When I went to give it to her, replied Sancho, she was hard at it swaying from side to side with a lot of wheat she had in the sieve, and she said to me, lay the letter, friend, on the top of that sack, for I cannot read it until I have done sifting all this. Discreet lady, said Don Quixote, that was in order to read it at her leisure and enjoy it, proceed, Sancho, while she was engaged in her occupation what converse did she hold with thee? What did she ask about me, and what answer didst thou give? Make haste, tell me all, and let not an atom be left behind in the ink bottle. She asked me nothing, said Sancho, but I told her how your worship was left doing penance in her service, naked from the waist up, in among these mountains like a savage, sleeping on the ground, not eating bread off a tablecloth nor combing your beard, weeping and cursing your fortune. In saying I cursed my fortune thou saidst wrong, said Don Quixote, for rather do I bless it and shall bless it all the days of my life for having made me worthy of aspiring to love so lofty a lady as Dulcinea del Toboso and so lofty she is, said Sancho, that she overtops me by more than a hand's breadth. What? Sancho, said Don Quixote, didst thou measure with her? I measured in this way, said Sancho, going to help her to put a sack of wheat on the back of an ass, we came so close together that I could see she stood more than a good palm over me. Well, said Don Quixote, and doth she not of a truth accompany and adorn this greatness with a thousand million charms of mind. But one thing thou wilt not deny, Sancho, when thou camest close to her didst thou not perceive a Sabian odor, an aromatic fragrance, a, I know not what, delicious, that I cannot find a name for, I mean a redolence, an exhalation, as if thou wert in the shop of some dainty glover. All I can say is, said Sancho, that I did perceive a little odor, something goaty, it must have been that she was all in a sweat with hard work. It could not be that, said Don Quixote, but thou must have been suffering from cold in the head, or must have smelt thyself for I know well what would be the scent of that rose among thorns, that lily of the field, that dissolved amber. Maybe so, replied Sancho, there often comes from myself that same odour which then seemed to me to come from her grace the Lady Dulcinea, but that's no wonder, for one devil is like another. Well then, continued Don Quixote, now she has done sifting the corn and sent it to the mill, what did she do when she read the letter? As for the letter, said Sancho, she did not read it, for she said she could neither read nor write, instead of that she tore it up into small pieces, saying that she did not want to let anyone read it lest her secrets should become known in the village, and that what I had told her by word of mouth about the love your worship bore her, and the extraordinary penance you were doing for her sake, was enough, and, to make an end of it, she told me to tell your worship that she kissed your hands, and that she had a greater desire to see you than to write to you, and that therefore she entreated and commanded you, on sight of this present, to come out of these thickets, and to have done with carrying on absurdities, and to set out at once for El Toboso, unless something else of greater importance should happen, for she had a great desire to see your worship. 
She laughed greatly when I told her how your worship was called the Knight of the Rueful Countenance, I asked her if that Biscayne the other day had been there, and she told me he had, and that he was an honest fellow, I asked her too about the galley slaves, but she said she had not seen any as yet. So far all goes well, said Don Quixote, but tell me what jewel was it that she gave thee on taking thy leave, in return for thy tidings of me? For it is a usual and ancient custom with knights and ladies errant to give the squires, damsels, or dwarfs who bring tidings of their ladies to the knights, or of their knights to the ladies, some rich jewel as a guerdon for good news, and acknowledgement of the message. That is very likely, said Sancho, and a good custom it was, to my mind, but that must have been in days gone by, for now it would seem to be the custom only to give a piece of bread and cheese, because that was what my lady Dulcinea gave me over the top of the yard wall when I took leave of her, and more by token it was sheep's milk cheese. She is generous in the extreme, said Don Quixote, and if she did not give thee a jewel of gold, no doubt it must have been because she had not one to hand there to give thee, but sleeves are good after Easter, I shall see her and all shall be made right. But knowest thou what amazes me, Sancho? It seems to me thou must have gone and come through the air, for thou hast taken but little more than three days to go to El Toboso and return, though it is more than thirty leagues from here to there. From which I am inclined to think that the sage magician who is my friend, and watches over my interests, for of necessity there is and must be one, or else I should not be a right knight errant, that this same, I say, must have helped thee to travel without thy knowledge, for some of these sages will catch up a knight errant sleeping in his bed, and without his knowing how or in what way it happened, he wakes up the next day more than a thousand leagues away from the place where he went to sleep. And if it were not for this, knights errant would not be able to give aid to one another in peril, as they do at every turn. For a knight, maybe, is fighting in the mountains of Armenia with some dragon, or fierce serpent, or another knight, and gets the worst of the battle, and is at the point of death, but when he least looks for it, there appears over against him on a cloud, or chariot of fire, another knight, a friend of his, who just before had been in England, and who takes his part, and delivers him from death, and at night he finds himself in his own quarter supping very much to his satisfaction, and yet from one place to the other will have been two or three thousand leagues. And all this is done by the craft and skill of the sage enchanters who take care of those valiant knights, so that, friend Sancho, I find no difficulty in believing that thou mayest have gone from this place to El Toboso and returned in such a short time, since, as I have said, some friendly sage must have carried thee through the air without thee perceiving it. That must have been it, said Sancho, for indeed Rocinante went like a gypsy's ass with Quicksilver in his ears. Quicksilver, said Don Quixote, I and what is more, a legion of devils, folk that can travel and make others travel without being weary, exactly as the whim seizes them. But putting this aside, what thinkest thou I ought to do about my lady's command to go and see her? For though I feel that I am bound to obey her mandate, I feel too that I am debarred by the boon I have accorded to the princess that accompanies us, and the law of chivalry compels me to have regard for my word and preference to my inclination, on the one hand the desire to see my lady pursues and harasses me, on the other my solemn promise and the glory I shall win in this enterprise urge and call me, but what I think I shall do is to travel with all speed and reach quickly the place where this giant is, and on my arrival I shall cut off his head, and establish the princess peacefully in her realm, and forthwith I shall return to behold the light that lightens my senses, to whom I shall make such excuses that she will be led to approve of my delay, for she will see that it entirely tends to increase her glory and fame, for all that I have won, am winning, or shall win by arms in this life, comes to me of the favour she extends to me, and because I am hers. Ah! What a sad state your worship's brains are in, said Sancho. Tell me, senor, do you mean to travel all that way for nothing, and to let slip and lose so rich and great a match as this where they give as a portion a kingdom that in sober truth I have heard say is more than twenty thousand leagues round about, and abounds with all things necessary to support human life, and is bigger than Portugal and Castile put together. Peace, for the love of God. Blush for what you have said, and take my advice, and forgive me, and marry at once in the first village where there is a curate, if not, here is our licentiate who will do the business beautifully, remember, I am old enough to give advice, and this I am giving comes pat to the purpose, for a sparrow in the hand is better than a vulture on the wing, and he who has the good to his hand and chooses the bad, that the good he complains of may not come to him. Look here, Sancho, said Don Quixote. If thou art advising me to marry, in order that immediately on slaying the giant I may become king, and be able to confer favours on thee, and give thee what I have promised, let me tell thee I shall be able very easily to satisfy thy desires without marrying, for before going into battle I will make it a stipulation that, if I come out of it victorious, even I do not marry, they shall give me a portion of the kingdom, that I may bestow it upon whomsoever I choose, 
and when they give it to me upon whom wouldst thou have me bestow it but upon thee? That is plain speaking, said Sancho, but let your worship take care to choose it on the sea coast, so that if I don't like the life, I may be able to ship off my black vassals and deal with them as I have said, don't mind going to see my lady Dulcinea now, but go and kill this giant and let us finish off this business, for by God it strikes me it will be one of great honour and great profit. I hold thou art in the right of it, Sancho, said Don Quixote, and I will take thy advice as to accompanying the princess before going to see Dulcinea, but I counsel thee not to say anything to any one, or to those who are with us, about what we have considered and discussed, for as Dulcinea is so decorous that she does not wish her thoughts to be known it is not right that I or any one for me should disclose them. Well then, if that be so, said Sancho, how is it that your worship makes all those you overcome by your arm go to present themselves before my lady Dulcinea, this being the same thing as signing your name to it that you love her and are her lover? And as those who go must perforce kneel before her and say they come from your worship to submit themselves to her, how can the thoughts of both of you be hid? Oh, silly and simple thou art, said Don Quixote, seest thou not, Sancho, that this tends to her greater exultation? For thou must know that according to our way of thinking and chivalry, it is a high honour to a lady to have many knights errant in her service, whose thoughts never go beyond serving her for her own sake, and who look for no other reward for their great and true devotion than that she should be willing to accept them as her knights. It is with that kind of love, said Sancho, I have heard preachers say we ought to love our Lord, for himself alone, without being moved by the hope of glory or the fear of punishment, though for my part, I would rather love and serve him for what he could do. The devil take thee for a clown, said Don Quixote, and what shrewd things thou sayest at times. One would think thou hadst studied. In faith, then, I cannot even read. Master Nicholas here called out to them to wait a while, as they wanted to halt and drink at a little spring there was there. Don Quixote drew up, not a little to the satisfaction of Sancho, for he was by this time weary of telling so many lies, and in dread of his master catching him tripping, for though he knew that Dulcinea was a peasant girl of El Toboso, he had never seen her in all his life. Cardenio had now put on the clothes which Dorothea was wearing when they found her, and though they were not very good, they were far better than those he put off. They dismounted together by the side of the spring, and with what the curate had provided himself with at the inn they appeased, though not very well, the keen appetite they all of them brought with them. While they were so employed there happened to come by a youth passing on his way, who stopping to examine the party at the spring, the next moment ran to Don Quixote and clasping him round the legs, began to weep freely, saying, Oh, senor, do you not know me? Look at me well, I am that lad Andres that your worship released from the oak tree where I was tied. Don Quixote recognized him, and taking his hand he turned to those present and said, that your worships may see how important it is to have knights errant to redress the wrongs and injuries done by tyrannical and wicked men in this world, I may tell you that some days ago passing through a wood, I heard cries and piteous complaints as of a person in pain and distress, I immediately hastened, impelled by my bounden duty, to the quarter whence the plaintive accents seemed to me to proceed, and I found tied to an oak this lad who now stands before you, which in my heart I rejoice at, for his testimony will not permit me to depart from the truth in any particular. He was, I say, tied to an oak, naked from the waist up, and a clown, whom I afterwards found to be his master, was scarifying him by lashes with the reins of his mare. As soon as I saw him I asked the reason of so cruel a flagellation. The boar replied that he was flogging him because he was his servant and because of carelessness that proceeded rather from dishonesty than stupidity, on which this boy said, Senor, he flogs me only because I ask for my wages. The master made I know not what speeches and explanations, which, though I listened to them, I did not accept. In short, I compelled the clown to unbind him, and to swear he would take him with him, and pay him real by real, and perfumed into the bargain. Is not all this true, Andres my son? Didst thou not mark with what authority I commanded him, and with what humility he promised to do all I enjoined, specified, and required of him? Answer without hesitation, tell these gentlemen what took place, that they may see that it is as great an advantage as I say to have knights errant abroad. All that your worship has said is quite true, answered the lad, but the end of the business turned out just the opposite of what your worship supposes. How? The opposite? said Don Quixote, did not the clown pay thee then? Not only did he not pay me, replied the lad, but as soon as your worship had passed out of the wood and we were alone, he tied me up again to the same oak and gave me a fresh flogging, that left me like a flayed Saint Bartholomew and every stroke he gave me he followed up with some jest or jibe about having made a fool of your worship, and but for the pain I was suffering I should have laughed at the things he said. In short he left me in such a condition that I have been until now in a hospital getting cured of the injuries which that rascally clown inflicted on me then, for all which your worship is to blame, 
For if you had gone your own way and not come where there was no call for you, nor meddled in other people's affairs, my master would have been content with giving me one or two dozen lashes, and would have then loosed me and paid me what he owed me. But when your worship abused him so out of measure, and gave him so many hard words, his anger was kindled, and as he could not revenge himself on you, as soon as he saw you had left him the storm burst upon me in such a way, that I feel as if I should never be a man again. The mischief, said Don Quixote, lay in my going away, for I should not have gone until I had seen thee paid, because I ought to have known well by long experience that there is no clown who will keep his word if he finds it will not suit him to keep it, but thou rememberest, Andres, that I swore if he did not pay thee I would go and seek him, and find him though he were to hide himself in the whale's belly. That is true, said Andres, but it was of no use. Thou shalt see now whether it is of use or not, said Don Quixote, and so saying, he got up hastily and bade Sancho bridle Rocinante, who was browsing while they were eating. Dorothea asked him what he meant to do. He replied that he meant to go in search of this clown and chastise him for such iniquitous conduct, and see Andres paid to the last Maravetti, despite and in the teeth of all the clowns in the world. To which she replied that he must remember that in accordance with his promise he could not engage in any enterprise until he had concluded hers, and that as he knew this better than anyone, he should restrain his ardour until his return from her kingdom. That is true, said Don Quixote, and Andres must have patience until my return as you say, Senora, but I once more swear and promise not to stop until I have seen him avenged and paid. I have no faith in those oaths, said Andres, I would rather have now something to help me to get to Seville than all the revenges in the world, if you have here anything to eat that I can take with me, give it me, and God be with your worship and all knights errant, and may their errands turn out as well for themselves as they have for me. Sancho took out from his store a piece of bread and another of cheese, and giving them to the lad he said, Here, take this, brother Andres, for we have all of us a share in your misfortune. Why, what share have you got? This share of bread and cheese I am giving you, answered Sancho, and God knows whether I shall feel the one of it myself or not, for I would have you know, friend, that we squires to knights errant have to bear a great deal of hunger and hard fortune, and even other things more easily felt than told. Andres seized his bread and cheese, and seeing that nobody gave him anything more, bent his head, and took hold of the road, as the saying is. However, before leaving he said, For the love of God, Sir Knight Errant, if you ever meet me again, though you may see them cutting me to pieces, give me no aid or succour, but leave me to my misfortune, which will not be so great but that a greater will come to me by being helped by your worship, on whom and all the knights errant that have ever been born God send his curse. Don Quixote was getting up to chastise him, but he took to his heels at such a pace that no one attempted to follow him, and mightily chapfallen was Don Quixote at Andres' story, and the others had to take great care to restrain their laughter so as not to put him entirely out of countenance. エンゴ聞き流しリスニング、英語テキストとMP3ダウンロード、その他の物語はホームページからお聞きいただけます。88thpp.com88thpp.com